So now, um, Kate Murray from the Library of Congress is going to speak on advances with FAGI's MXF AS07 implementation, collaboration, and beyond. Fine. Yeah, I think I'm good. I think so. Um, by the way, these are candies. I think if anyone, oh, the... okay, awesome. I was wondering what those were for. So um, I'm Kate Murray, and um, as uh, Kieran said, I'm from the Library of Congress, um, uh, and I work in a section called uh, Digital Collections and Management Services. Uh, this is my second appearance at uh, No Time to Wait. I was at the first one, and I must say it was a real watershed moment for me. Uh, I got to meet a lot of people I've been talking with face to face, but also I, I was so impressed with the community and the collaboration and the cooperation of the group that I'm, I'm thrilled to be back today. Um, I am a, a little bit about me, not, not as much as Ashley shared, but a little bit about me, is that um, I'm, I'm not an implementer, right? I, I don't work in the, the labs at Culpeper. I'm very much on the policy research and development side. Um, I am both a standards author, standards with a small s, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, and also a consumer. My other day job, um, I'll talk about FADGI in a moment, but my other day job is the, I author the Sustainability of Digital Formats website for the Library of Congress. <coughs> so um, I read, my standard joke about that is, you know, I read the RFC so you don't have to, right? And we sort of parse those and talk about what they mean for um, actions and preservation and, uh, and archiving. So let's see if I can figure this out. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, FAGI, the, it's called, pronounced FAGI, right? It's a terrible acronym. Um, it predated me. Um, and some people pronounce it fad guy, but it's really FAGI. So, um, and it's a, which I, I like fad guy, you know, it, it could stick. Uh, it, it, it's, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great group of people who do really good work. We changed the meaning of our acronym from uh, the federal agency's digitization guidelines, uh, Federal Agencies Digitization Guidelines, the Federal Agencies Digital Guidelines earlier this year to better reflect the sort of work that we do. Uh, FADGI is led by the Library of Congress, but it's uh, comprised of 20 different federal agencies, U.S. federal agencies. I think we'll actually have 21 because I got a note yesterday from the National Science Foundation with the, who would like to join FADGI. Um, it's primarily uh, comprised of uh, folks in the cultural heritage community, so the Library of Congress, the U.S. National Archives, the Smithsonian, but we also have uh, membership from uh, Department of Justice. Uh, we have two members from NASA, um, and NOAA participates, although they're not a formal member. Uh, an important uh, scope about FADGI, it's by U.S. federal agencies for U.S. federal agencies, so we're thrilled when other folks use our work, but um, that context would, would sort of help explain some of the things that we do. Um, we have two working groups, um, one that's focused on uh, still image uh, work and you may be familiar with their uh, technical guidelines for a still image digitization and they have that star rating that lots of folks like uh, and that's led by my colleague Tom Rieger and I lead the federal agencies, pardon me, I, I lead the audio visual working group um, which is uh, about audio, motion picture film and, and video. A um, couple of our big projects that FADGI has done which uh, may put some context um, for you. We have, uh, we did some file format comparison work a few years ago. Uh, we did a uh, standard operating uh, procedures for digitizing motion picture film. We have a current project that we're working on uh, performance testing for A to C converters. Uh, and we have guidelines up about that. They're actually on our FADGI website, but we haven't announced them yet because we're waiting. <laughs> so you can all go look at them. Um, but we'll have an open comment period about that in a minute. Um, but uh, we're waiting for uh, some licensing issues to be standardized so that we can release some open source software to facilitate the automated testing of ADC converters, and that software was developed by AV Preserve. Um, we also did s uh, a recent publication about um, embedding metadata into DPX files, which is why uh, Kieran pointed at me earlier <laughs> about DPX, um, and I can talk about DPX in a little bit. Not here. If you want to talk to me about that later, I'm happy to do it. And um, one of our um, biggest projects and our well, most well-known projects is um, we developed the guidelines and provided the early funding for um, BWF MetaEdit, which is where we first connected with Jerome and Dave and, and all of those um, nice folks. And, um, and Jerome put out some recent updates on that for which we are grateful. Um, and I'm thrilled to be here today, and it's even on our website. Um, so, um, sorry, give me just a 
second year. So um, let's talk about ASO7, which is not FFE1 in Matroska, as you may, may have noticed. So um, ASO7 uh, is a, um, it's a profile or an application specification for MXF, which is the material exchange format, which is standardized by SIMPTI. Some important changes that have happened since last year, I'll go through more of them later, but just some important things, um, is that this version of ASO7 uh, is published on the FAGI website, which is digitizationguidelines.gov, uh, and not, not through AMWA. We published through AMWA last year. Um, AMWA, I'll go into a little bit more detail later, but they basically changed their business model. AMWA stands for the Advanced Media Workflow Association. Um, and they changed their business model. We're not necessarily a great fit, um, but we're keeping the name, right? Like in any divorce, you get to keep your name, right? So we are um, we're ASO7 and we're going to keep it. Um, FAGI, uh, especially the Library of Congress, has led the sponsorship of uh, ASO7, uh, but it we have worked with a, a variety of folks, including the U.S. National Archives, um, uh, the Canadian Broadcasting um, Corporation. Uh, we've had AB Preserve. We've had some vendors. Uh, Cube Tech, EVS, uh, George Blood, uh, Metaglue. Um, it's, it's what I consider our magnum opus, although I'm feeling pretty good because when Ashley showed the FFV1, it was 200 and something pages and change, and ours is up to 117. So I, I, I'm feeling pretty good about that now. Um, it's actually three pages longer than it was last year when I gave this talk. So um, and I'll talk a little bit about why that is. Um, so what is ASO7 and what is ASO7 not, <laughs> right? So um, ASO7 is not a standard with a capital S, right? Um, FADG is not a standards body, right? We uh, develop guidelines and best practices, but we're not a standard body in, in that we don't have an official um, standards, uh, you know, we don't have a voting body. And, and um, the uh, MXF is really the standard behind a ASO7, and we pull from lots of uh, related standards. Um, but MXF itself is standardized by SIMT through ST3771. Um, and we consider ASO7 to be um, a profile or um, sort of a, a, a series of constraints um, that support greater interoperability uh, and um, we hope will lead towards greater um, adoption and therefore better format sustainability. So um, I don't have to tell folks in this room that, that, that ASO7 is not for everyone, right? I, or, right actually, MXF is not for everyone, certainly. Um, we don't consider it uh, uh, the, the, the answer to all questions. Um, national libraries and um, other large, broad, uh, large archives that have broadcast collections is where we feel our sweet spot is. These are where you're going to find collections that have multiple time codes and audio tracks, captions and time text and segmented essences and the need to embed metadata beyond sort of the basic um, components. Um, this is where we feel that there's really a market for MXF. If your collections do not have these kind of complex structures, you certainly, MXF may not be uh, the answer for you. Um, not all FAGI members plan to uh, implement MXF. Uh, certainly the U.S. National Archives won't. They use AVI at this point. Um, but we feel that it's a, it's a valid option for um, these kind of complex collections. It's not the only option, but it's certainly a valid one. Um, and if you're curious to see if uh, MXF is be useful to you, um, uh, this paper with the link there, um, which was authored by my colleague Carl Fleischauer, um, is a great place to start. Um, by the way, I'll mention that all of the links I talk about today um, are available on the FADGI website. So uh, just some brief highlights about MXF. Um, one of the places we feel that we spent a lot of time on it was um, about multiple time codes, and, and we hear from folks that maybe they don't need to keep all of their multiple time codes from their legacy videotapes. Um, we would argue that if you are, uh, that, that it's probably a best practice that you might want to follow. Um, there are a number of different types of time codes, right? They'll the, be the historical source time codes, and that phrase comes from EBU, but that's the time codes that you inherit from your videotape. But you'd also want to put down what we say is a master time code, and that would be high integrity and a continuous new time code that you'd want to put down. Um, one of the things about MXF is that um, there, uh, uh, MXF is, is made up of partitions, and they call them generic stream partitions. One of them is called the generic stream partition. Um, and within that, you can carry a number of different things, including text-based, or uh, and that would be like binary data, or pardon me, text-based or XML data, or binary data, something like a still image, a picture of a box, 
Um, and you can also include things like EBU SDL and other associated data um, that you might want to uh, carry, including like an image of a packaging of the box or, or some supplementary metadata, something like a Mavis record um, that the Library of Congress would use. Um, there's lots of different uh, options for parametric metadata in MXF, uh, and that's carried through um, picture and sound essence descriptors, um, and that's described uh, in SMPTE uh, 371, 377-1. Um, but we saw a need in, in AS07 um, really responding to some of the needs of the Library of Congress to embed additional technical metadata, so that could be process metadata or information about the source item. Um, and there's another type of descriptive metadata in MXF. It's called the DMS, a Descriptive Metadata Scheme. And we developed a new one within AS07. And it's, it follows the embedded metadata guidelines that FAGI typically, typically implements. And that's information, sort of high level information about who owns this item, um, what are some identifiers about this item, where can I find more information about this item. Um, so uh, those are some of the features. Um, Captions, um, captions are a big deal, uh, and subtitles are a big deal in broadcast collections. Uh, in, in the US, we typically have some binary coded uh, captioning. In Europe, there's uh, EBU SDL. Um, folks are really moving towards time text. Um, I saw a joke on Twitter about time text for karaoke. I think that somebody put out, which I thought was pretty funny, right? So it's like the ultimate time text. Um, so uh, in ASU7, uh, we use, uh, we follow the SIMTI RP272057 um, that recommends carrying time text as in the generic stream partition. Um, FAGI also has lots of ways to um, label or allocate soundtracks and tagging languages, and that's very helpful, obviously, if you have multiple audio tracks. Um, we spent quite a bit of time on content integrity. Uh, we adapted a hybrid of the way the BBC does it and the way the SMPTE Digital Cinema folks do it. Um, so, and we do frame level, uh, it's not really frame level, it's at the KLV level. Um, it, it, in ASO7, I'll mention that we do have a set of graded sample files uh, available on the SPAGI website. Uh, however, content integrity is not included in those files. We couldn't afford to put it in this time, but um, hopefully with, with a new release. So, um, ASO7 is really, MXF and ASO7 are really about the structure of the wrapper, not the encodings per se. The current mappings that we have for ASO7 uh, cover uncompressed, uh, which is what uh, the US National Archives uses, and JPEG 2000, which is what the Library of Congress uses. Um, any encoding could be mapped in into uh, ASO7. It does have to have a SMPTE encoding to MXF wrapper. Um, and there was some uh, work towards mapping FFV1 to uh, MXF, and when that happens, uh, we're, uh, when that, that happens within SMPTE, we're happy to participate and make that come about. So um, let's talk a little bit about what's different um, this time, uh, what, what we've done um, for the past years. So we had a public comment period that opened after our publication of our 2016. Uh, version, and we got lots of comments, and uh, we, we were grateful for those comments, right? Um, uh, uh, Cube Tech provided some great comments. I think Cube Tech is here in the room, and they provided some very uh, helpful comments for us. There's a diff list of all of the changes between the old specification and the new specification um, available there on the FAGI website. Um, so a couple of the things that we corrected or updated. Um, first of all, we corrected the JPEG 2000 uh, wrapping. We had the wrong one. Right? We, it, we should have had... Um, the, uh, the files should have had uh, what's called case I1 in SMPTE, and that's, um, they should have had, pardon me, they should have had I2, I'm doing it myself, right? They should have had I2, um, which is a two fields for KLV uh, element, but they accidentally had uh, I1, which is one field per KLV, um, so we had that corrected. Um, there was also what we noticed in 117 page specification is that you often, not often, but you can contradict yourself. Um, so we had uh, fixing some of those contradictions. We also realized that sometimes the underlying documentation from SMPTE was incorrect. Um, and when we found that, uh, we have been feeding that information back to SMPTE. Um, uh, we also had some issues with um, our URLs not resolving, um, but that's all pretty much been solved. 
Um, we had some errors in our XML manifest. The manifest is basically just an outline of what's in the file, an XML version of what's in the file. Um, we had some errors in our XML, so um, that's been taken care of. Um, and we had the usual sort of typos and administrivia that we fixed. So what's new in this version of AS07? Um, we had a blog post on the library's blog, which is called The Signal, one of the library's blogs, which is called The Signal. Um, and uh, in that blog post, um, we got the great news that um, the Culpeper, the National Audiovisual Conservation Center down in Culpeper, Virginia, which is part of the Library of Congress, will implement AS07, right? So they'll be moving towards that, not immediately, but they'll be moving towards that. Um, and that will really help with our adoption, uh, we feel, and options for other folks to use AS07 as well. Um, we also included some illustrative examples of the picture format. These are not restrictive, right? These are just some illustrated examples. Um, we now have an external version of our manifest, um, which is available as a separate XML, also on the FAGI site. Um, we have a new set of graded sample files, which were created by EVS, um, Valerie Popey from EVS. Um, they don't have content integrity. Um, but I'd encourage all of you guys to download them and use them as much as you can and let us know if you come across any errors. Um, and again, we mo we've moved away um, from, at, from uh, AMWA uh, to SMPTE. So um, AMWA worked for us for a while. Um, they are a, a, an industry, um, uh, a vendor neutral uh, uh, organization. Uh, and it was important for us as a U.S. federal agency to have a space where we could talk to vendors in, in a neutral way. Um, and they had published a, a, a they, they uh, at the time when we, we paired up with them, were focused on um, developing these ASs or these application specifications. And they did one for the BBC and some other folks. Um, they've moved on now, and now they focus on um, the industry-based move to IP-based architectures, and they don't really uh, work on standards anymore. So um, this version of AS07 is published on the FADGI website, as I've mentioned, um, but we're moving into SMPTE. We're going to create an RDD, which is called a Registered Disclosure Document. Um, uh, uh, and why are we moving to SMPTE? Uh, it will give us the stability that we need to work within a sort of a defined standards protocol. It will line up with the supporting standards uh, uh, of, of MXF. Um, it's, it's recognized in the industry, especially the broadcast industry. Um, where we think the ASO7 sweet spot is. And again, at, at, at FAGI is not a standards body. And we needed a wider range of participants outside the U.S. federal agencies, which have a sort of a very um, uh, specific look. Um, access to open standards are very important to FAGI. Um, we helped, uh, we, and especially my colleague Carl Fleischauer, um, really pushed uh, AMWA to develop, um, uh, to use open uh, licenses and um, Creative Commons, I couldn't think of the word, <laughs> Creative Commons licenses. Uh, the current version of, of the FAGI document continues to hold that Creative Commons license, and we'll work with SMPTE um, so that that license is, stays with that. Um, there are issues, obviously, of the underlying SMPTE specifications are behind a paywall. Uh, ASO 7, part, a good chunk of its 117 pages are um, informative sections which explain what is in the supporting documents. Um, and we have done that sort of on purpose, so even if you don't get, if you don't have access to the underlying SMPTE documents, you can still implement AS07 with, the, um, with much of the um, explanatory uh, in, in information sections that we've um, authored. Um, so what happens now? Um, what are we working on now? Um, so with the specification stable, we're really able to focus much more on adoptions. Um, we do have uh, vendors that have ASO7 compliant tools, um, Cubetex, Quadriga Video, um, MX Fixer, which is uh, developed by Metaglue, um, EVS all have uh, ASO7 compliant tools. Um, we've been in conversations with Telestream and Dillette have also expressed interest. And certainly as the Library of Congress moves towards implementation, we expect this list to grow. Uh, we're very keen to develop open source options for ASO7. Uh, we do have a tool coming in fiscal year 2019, which is about a year from now, um, it, uh, that will uh, batch embed metadata into MXF files according to ASO7 um, and uh, perhaps do some high level conformance checking. Um, and yeah, some high level conformance checking. Um, 
we will start to spread the word more about ASO7. One thing that I find super impressive about the media conch crowd is how good they are at um, sort of ev every conference you are at, <laughs> there's media conch. Um, and I, I think that's certainly that we can learn from, as well as their um, willingness to sort of work out in the open. I think that's been great. Um, we have some new content coming for our sample files. We've recently uh, had the approval from um, PBS, the public broadcasting stations in the US, um, to use some of their sample file material, which has a uh, time code and uh, analog uh, in line 21. Um, and there will also be longer content. Our current sample files are just a few seconds long, and these will be several minutes, if not longer, you know, maybe 10 or 20 minutes long, which is great. Um, and we've also had some interest in developing potentially some new source um, some new uh, developing sample files from some other source material like PAL, which we don't have all that much of in the U.S., although Culpepper certainly has that. Um, I have a feeling I talked really fast, but... Um, oh, five minutes. All right. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, so, uh, again, I'm thrilled to be here. I sort of represent a different perspective. Um, Dave and I have been in contact for uh, forever over the years, um, and we really feel like, you know, there's different strokes for different folks, right? MXF will work for some folks. Um, FFE1 and Matrosco will work for other folks. And um, yeah, it's been great to be here. Thank you so much. Carl Ugin. Um, sorry, I have so many questions, I don't know where to start. Did you say that? If I don't have access to the MXF specification that is non-free, if I understand correctly, I can still implement it by just reading the AS07 specification or standard? Well, I, maybe that's an oversimplification on my part. I would say you would definitely, one of the things I should say, we don't have a machine readable implementation of AS07, right? So you would still need a lot of the background information, but I think that through accessing the informative sections, you could sort of narrow down what you would need to get. And, and we recognize that having those specifications beyond the SMPTE paywall is certainly problematic. Okay. Um, my other question is that I under, if I understand correctly, you are defining profiles. And so obviously, I, the way I understand it, valid AS07 files have to confirm to that profiles. Correct. So what is the, the thing that I want to archive originally does not fall within these profiles. So le let's assume a video file from a video game from the 80s. Uh, it has certainly not the resolution of uh, 576 or something like that and it does not even have the frame rate of 24 or 23 or whatever but 15 or 22 frames per second. So how do you put that into an AS07? Well, you could wrap the whole thing and put it in the generic stream partition. Also, that it may not be a good fit for an AS07 file. Okay. And wait, I have a last question, sorry. Um, at the end of the Matroska talk, there were two, I believe, identical questions. Uh, when will it be usable? And the answer was, well, 16 years ago, or perhaps 10 years ago. So my question is, would you say that MXF is a usable format? MXF or ASO7? Sorry? MXF or ASO7? Well, you, so you would say that ASO7 at least is definitely a usable format. So I, I would say we're based on MXF, and MXF is in, in, in use in many broadcast archives, including the Library of Congress now. The constraints, the, the profile of ASO7 uh, is not implemented anywhere right yet because we have just finished the standard and now the tools are in development. So uh, I would say it's usable now it, if you have the tools to do that. So there are tools available, um, but not even the Library of Cong Congress has implemented ASO7. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you might have just time for one more um, very short question or comment. Uh, Bert? Or Benjamin Tarkas. 
Hi, thank you. Um, I was just curious about content integrity. Um, could you describe that a little bit more? I wasn't sure exactly what you were referring sure, to. Sure, um, so we use a hybrid type of content integrity, and let me see if I can get back to it. Do I not have time to go backwards? So, um, so uh, the content integrity is on, is we, this, the MXF uh, works at the KLV, not at the frame rate. So we do content integrity on each individual KLV, and we use a hybrid of the BBC system and what the digital cinema folks do. Um, we use a CRC, let's check my notes. It's a Castagnoli something or other. Hold on one second. Uh, CRC 32C, um, and that's the change uh, that we uh, that the BBC did not do, and we decided to use that in, to follow the digital cinema specification for sort of a long list of reasons, which I can go into later. Um, and again, it's not implemented in our sample files just because we didn't have the funds to pay for that development time. If you talk super quick or no? Uh, no, I, I'm just conscious of um, Yvonne's panel. Oh yeah, then I'll, let so. me get off. Thank you so much, Kate. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, I have loads of questions.